Are you a home grower looking for a little bit of help? Are you ready to learn as much as you can about your favorite hobby? The Homegrown Helpers brings you informative interviews from experienced growers that have taken the next steps in their journey and decided to help you grow top quality cannabis all in your home. Now welcome in our host, Rob Smith, along with this week's Homegrown Helper. And welcome to the show, everyone. Are you ready for this week's Grow Tips and Tricks from another Homegrown Helper? All right, me too. So this week I interview AJ Ortonstone, and AJ is kind of an IPM specialist. He is probably going to do a Growcast interview here very shortly, talking about IPM and the importance and his his personal experiences and protocols when it comes to you know eliminating those pests and molds and mildews from your garden. Last week I did a solo show and I, I really hope you guys enjoy that. That was that was a good time for me sitting down and kind of reflecting on my past experiences in the grow and some of the things that I've learned from doing this show and producing Growcast and talking with a lot of growers and and people behind the scenes. Um, you know, Instagram DMs are, are always a great place to reach out to us and see if we can help you out or we'll we'll turn it into a listener mailbag on Growcast and, and ask the one and only Wolfman for his opinion on on your question. So, you know, this week with AJ Ornstone, one of my favorite quotes from the show was, you're only as good as your weakest plant. And I've actually quoted that a couple of times in some Grow Talks. And AJ also talks about the one item that must remain in his garden and that is the jeweler's loop that's on our bonus content so you can check that out at the homegrownhelpers.com slash bonus and there you can find the last five questions that we ask all of our guests here on the show as well as myself i rocked that last week as part of the solo show um so we're still looking for some new guests you can email me at rob at the homegrownhelpers.com that's where you can find me or, or just DM me on Instagram. I, I manage both the Growcast and the Homegrown Helpers account there. So this week we have three sponsors for the show. It is Danny Danko with his book, Cannabis, A Beginner's Guide to Growing Marijuana, Harvest Mutual Seed Bank, and their wide selection of novelty bird seed, as they like to put it, and Dr. Zyme's Eliminator or the amazing Dr. Zyme's product line with their multi-purpose cleaner and the eliminator there. And we're doing a giveaway. So you can head over to our Instagram account, click on the link in both of our bios, Growcast and at the Homegrown Helpers. And you can score yourself a couple sample size bottles along with a wizard pin, a sweet wizard pin that says guard naked on it. And all you have to do is pay the shipping and handling of $6 for domestic shipping and $12 for international. And you can score yourself some samples and a wizard pin. So last up here, we have a review. It was just submitted yesterday. It was so good that I wanted to read it right off the bat. It is from Vinny B. 2696 And again, of course, we appreciate your ratings, reviews, subscribes and shares Um, but right now we're featuring some written reviews that are written by our audience Uh, this one is five stars of course and um, the comments are awesome podcast found growcast on here after listening to a different podcast about growing and looking for something else and love it then found out they have a second one here specializing in the home grower give it a listen great content we thank Vinny B 2696 for his comments and we're very proud of both of our shows here and we're looking to add new podcasts so stay tuned we might have a few announcements coming up but at the announcement of this we are just finishing up our first $5000 giveaway quarterly giveaway to our membership audience that is mygrowpass.com uh, if you want to get in for the January 1st drawing, you get entries every time that you get billed. So if you get in now, 
we will double your entries until October 5th. So anybody that buys a membership between now and October 5th will double their entries for this billing cycle for the January 1st drawing of $5,000 worth of grow gear that goes to five lucky winners. So right now in about a half an hour from when I'm talking to you right now, on Tuesday afternoon at 3.30 Eastern Time, we're gonna be releasing this stuff and our winners will probably already know by the time that you get a chance to listen to this. So thank you to all of our partners, all of our friends, and all of our listeners. Now let's get on to the show with AJ Ortonstone. All right, we are here with AJ. AJ, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, man. Pleasure to be here. AJ, why don't you uh, start us off just telling us a little bit about yourself. You know, give us your your full name, the the name of the company that you operate under, where you're located at, and, and how long you've been growing this beautiful plant of ours. Sure, yeah. My name's AJ Ortonstone. I'm actually from uh, Houston, Texas, but have been doing the medical thing in Arizona for a little bit and then moved up here um, to try to reach a larger audience with my growing, had a real passion for it, felt like I was pretty good at it, so I wanted to come up to Oregon. Um, I've worked for a couple different companies up here. I've uh, been head of cultivation at a couple different places and um, worked under some people that were very knowledgeable, gained a lot of experience, and now I'm with uh, Truly Organic, and uh, I'm running operations with them. We spell it like Oregonic, kind of like O-R-E-G-A-N-I-C, so that's a a little fun thing we did with with the name there, um, but we're we specialize in kind of an ocean grown style, so it's a little different. But we have a farm down in Bandon, which is on the coast of Oregon, and our farm is less than a mile away from the physical uh, Pacific Ocean. So we harvest all of our rainwater uh, off the coast, and then we actually just put that back onto living soil. So fully amended with down to earth nutrients from Oregon. So we try to have everything um, that touches our plant, Oregon made, Oregon bred just kind of organ through and through. Um, so we're really proud of what we're doing at Truly Organic, but um, I've, you know, kind of been doing indoor, outdoor, kind of everything. So I'm happy to be on the, the home grower consulting, especially um, just because I've always thought it starts with the home grower. And, you know, the passion starts with uh, pretty much in a home. I know some people have a special exception, but I mean, my my whole career started in a home, doing a home grow. I've been at it for a little under a decade now. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Quick question about this uh, farm that's a mile away from the coast or less than a mile away from the coast and you collect all that rainwater. I've heard different farmers say that that the rainwater collected so close to the ocean kind of varies in pH and, and maybe like a salt content or, or um, nutritional makeup because it's, you know, absorbed so much from the, the ocean water and then comes over in the first dumps are so close. Like, how do you interact with that? How do you mediate that? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really is hard to tell based off like acidity and, and everything like that. Um, you can always have freak things happen since, I mean, the world is, as we all know, changing pretty drastically, it seems sure, like. Sure. So, I mean, things definitely can come up. You can't catch everything. Um, I like to think I've, so I've been doing harvesting rainwater now, uh, or, you know, harvesting rainwater, putting it back onto soil for quite some time. Um, couple of years at least. And so there are definitely, definitely times where you are just sitting there like, what in the hell is going on? Is my pH off? What's happening? Especially if you're not in a full, um, I guess, quote unquote, organic system, you know, with bacteria and fungi and all that, that can take care of it itself. When you're mm. in, like when I used to, so I used to run it with uh, synthetics. I would do um, just because of the investors I had at the time, but I was doing harvested rainwater and mixing that with synthetics. And it was almost impossible to pH the rainwater when it was just like a water day. And even mixing with the synthetics, it was the synthetics that claims that they self pH, self pH buffer didn't really do it. Um, and that was because I believe there was a different chemical makeup, you know, of the rainwater, like you're saying. Mm, and then two, yeah. a big thing with rainwater that most people don't understand, or most people don't think of when you're collecting rainwater unless you just have a big open vat that the rainwater is falling into, which is damn near no one has right. the rainwater, you know, is hitting some type of surface and traveling into that collection reservoir. So it's a big, big importance in my opinion, to make sure that everything that water is falling on is very, very clean because God knows only what you can bring in to, you know, your collection reservoirs or your, your water. If you have stuff on a roof or, you know, gutters or, or however you're collecting it. 
Um, so it, it is definitely something that is hard to judge, but luckily with living soil, it kind of pH buffers itself. And then we do have the luxury of having um, quite a bit of natural magnesium in there. I would always use Epsom salts um, just kind of because uh, for early stages of flower, late stages of veg to really get those levels of magnesium up. But we really don't even have to do that anymore with our situation now. Oh, yeah. You bring up a really good point about keeping everything super clean. I mean, not only are you paying attention to, you know, the cleanliness of your plants and the environment around them, but, you know, the cleanliness of your water collection facility. I, I never really thought about that, but it makes perfect sense, you know, garbage in, garbage out type of scenario. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I actually, so I did consult for one person. Um, they actually had, I mean, long story short, there was a dead rat in a gutter. Um, so yeah and so like it was one of those where no one like what's that do to your water supply exactly yeah (laughs) Yeah. and we're not we're not in that level of being able to quite test into those extremes of like what does that mean or what did that mean but clearly when we found it we were like yeah that can't be good kind of thing no that can't be good at all yeah um you know you you brought up another point and i don't mean to get off on a bunch of tangents before we even get the interview going but um you know, it's kind of kind of my role here is to keep diving into to what you bring up. You know, these collection facilities that are more wide open as as contained with a higher salt content, which I assume that you have coming straight off the ocean, you know, with a larger open area, more water is evaporating during those warmer days, which is increasing your salt content, right? For sure. Yeah. And I mean it it definitely just depends too on the on I guess the how much sun we get from evaporation and everything like that while they're while it's always happening. I mean, you know, it's more extreme than other times, but right. our geographic location, especially right now, we're going to be I mean, I cross my fingers. I hope this isn't the case, but I feel like we're just going to start getting pelted by rain just day after day. And then being in our location, too, we can get really, really strong winds. Yeah, um, We do have the luxury that just depending on your view of climate change and all that, um, they claim that the um, Emerald Triangle is kind of moving up. Uh, so we could potentially, I guess, be considered to be in that now. But obviously, you know, everything's I'm not a geologist, so I'm not I'm going to leave that to them. But we could have, I guess, better growing conditions moving forward in the future, uh, which is kind of exciting for us just based off the change. How far are you guys in the flower up there right now? Right now, uh, so for our outdoor, um, we're looking at, we're probably going to be pulling down in about a week or two. And wow. then uh, we do have a indoor light uh, facility, light dip. Um, so for that, you know, we can run all year long. Sure. Uh, sure. But we're going to be, you know, for those, it's it's just kind of, you know, like I said, we're running all year long. So they don't really need to match up with anything in particular. We tried to stagger them a little bit, but we might be harvesting kind of everything all at once. We're going to see what happens with the the indoor stuff though. Cause we can, you know, take that to the very, very end. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I I'm up here in the Northeast and I was just over at my father-in-law's place and I'd say the earliest of his plants probably has three weeks left. And, uh, you know, there's plants I'd love to see go an extra four or five weeks at this point in time. He's got these two different phenotypes of a blue dream, you know, the short stocky fat buds already. And then the tall lanky like forearm size colas that are you know still have so much development to go and i mean we've been having great weather but i'm i i really just don't see see those finishing out just just yet this year so for sure yeah and i mean for ours too i i hope they can finish um i would say that we from what you just said we might be a little further along than you but yeah i mean i'm still in that same boat of like i don't know if it's going to be able to it's just a as you know, a case by case basis yep. with what's happening with wind and weather. Cause unfortunately for us is even if we do have a tarp and we can keep it locked down to where no water is getting in, the wind sometimes plays a factor that we're just unable to control. Well, you can't stop mother nature all the time. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So AJ, I, I don't think we got that. Do you have a name for your consulting business or do you just no, so- go underneath the organic? brand yeah so right now it's just truly organic we are starting one though and it's actually very exciting for me um that i'm going to be bringing a lot of friends that i've worked with in the organ industry um on and we are going to try to basically do consulting for whomever and anyone um in organ whether you be a home grower with four plants to uh, 
you know, a OLCC tier two with 10,000 points, like whatever it might be, we're going to have guys who's working in every aspect of the industry from retail all the way up to, you know, head of cultivation styles, um, everything from like what we're doing, living soil. to we have people that are doing straight up hydroponic, aeroponic um, and running farms. So trying to collect a, a band of really, really good people that just want to do right by the industry and kind of help everyone get better. Um, we all have our little special things. So that's kind of what I'm working on now. We're trying to keep it under our brands, but we might come up with a different name. So I guess just stay tuned for that. But it, it is happening right now. So we're getting that team together and hopefully are going to be running in about a month or two. Okay, great. Uh, let us know when you launch that. We'll we'll help promote it in any way that we can. Oh, awesome. Thank you, man. So AJ, um, do you have your own personal medical, personal grow at home or anything like that? Um, I do not currently. I mean, I do have the ability, which is nice to uh, do some small pheno hunting um, without flowering. So I do do some, um, just for personal sake, um, some pheno hunting from time to time for, you know, to when I can have time, I guess, to flower out for four of individual plants being a, a citizen of Oregon which is, is kind of fun to do. I do it in a four by four tent. Um, so I don't have much space at all, but, uh, pop a lot of seeds just to see kind of what I can find and what's fun out there. Uh, right now we got some, um, different things going. I got a Sunday driver, which I'm really happy about and got an orange crush blue lemon tie cross that I'm very, very ecstatic about. Haven't flowered it. Um, so just kind of pheno hunting and seeing what's up with those right now. Great. So with your large scale commercial grow, can you tell us, you know, how many plants and let's go with the indoor light depth scenario. How big is that grow? Kind of dazzle our listeners with, with some of those like sta astounding numbers of, you know, the types of lights you have in with the light depth, uh, number of plants you grow in. I mean, I, I assume you're on rolling beds of some sort, you know, kind of give us the rundown in there. Sure. So we're actually, um, we're doing it pretty old school, uh, 3000 square feet light depth facility. So we basically have, um, supplemental lighting coming through. Um, we're using thousand Watts. Don't really want to get too specific on equipment or anything like that, but we're using thousand Watts. Um, got the biggest thing I would say is probably, uh, taking care of the dehumidification, um, being in a full light depth, uh, you do have, you know, we do have some fresh air intakes, especially during the winter times that kind of combats really, uh, really strongly with those dehues. We, we do seal them off and everything like that. But that, I would say, is the biggest, um, I guess, hurdle we have to make. Uh, we do do everything on the ground, though. So we're in 25 gallons um, on the ground. Uh, so definitely a lot of labor of love gets put into all of our plants. We normally do our spikes um, throughout for different amendments that are needed um, throughout the flowering phase, but never use any synthetics. Uh, try to never, ever have to spray anything. Most of my background is an IPM, so I really try to get a good regimen for all the plants in terms of what bugs fight, you know, the bugs that we have in there that are causing problems. Um, we're always doing preventative stuff as well because, you know, you're you're only, I guess, as, as good as your unhealthiest plant um, just because of how fastly things can take over. So really try to, I guess, keep the numbers up with that. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of trailing off. Oh, in, no, the, in, that, in that space we have, let's see here. I would say it's roughly between, it can get over 100 plants, but we like to keep it around um, – I like to keep it around that size um, just so we can let our ladies get nice and big in those 25 gallons and kind of have room to do their thing. Um, we're all about really, you know, doing it a clean, efficient way, um, not really trying as much to to bang out. I mean, you know, obviously we do want to get as much weight as we can, but we want to get as much weight as we can in a, I guess, a, a very healthy manner for everyone. We've just seen too much stuff with, you know, rot and botrytis and unfortunately i don't i mean do what you will if you're in the market but i don't really believe in if if there is anything that's moldy or anything like that even sending it to processing just because i don't want anything concentrated that is a mold sure. um so we try to do our absolute best to make sure we never have to deal with those issues and in doing so you know we like to keep it a little bit more spaced out not so as crammed as some do great thanks for that rundown i appreciate that oh yeah no absolutely so you're helping a new grower set up AJ or, you know, giving some instructions to a fairly new grower. What are the things that you tell them to pay attention to 
to ensure that they have the healthiest plants overall? Well, by far, um, pH meter. So I would always tell the person if they don't have a pH meter or trunge meter to make sure that that is like the to just have that at all times, mainly because I believe that pH is the one thing that kind of, I guess, hits everybody at some time. Um, and most of the time when it does, it's not the first thing you think just because pH can show to be, you know, it, pH replicates so many other problems that can come up in the garden and it can resemble so many things that I think a lot of people um, kind of look over pH and, and how important it can be, depending on your growing style, obviously. Some, you know, sometimes if you put in water that's too hot, uh, you can get a really, really hard spike and that can really turn things quickly on you um, and make you think it's something else. So I always say, the meters and that is is my biggest thing um, is just making sure that water is exactly where you want it to be. Now, you know, give us some specifics. Where would you instruct somebody to have their the pH of their water going into a soil mix? Ooh, I mean, it, it really just depends on, I guess, on your amendments and, and what you're doing. But I mean, I would say generally in, a, in general terms, uh, about five, eight to six, two, you know, is pretty generic. Um, I like to go a little lower um, just depending on what media I'm using. But if I'm in like, let's say a, a cocoa, um, just a straight up cocoa, I might go like five, six to maybe five, nine. And then if I'm in maybe like a cocoa peat, I'm going to try to stay a little truer to that five, eight, six, two, somewhere in the middle, maybe around six. Just depends. Some people have claims that their nutrients, you know, are self-buffering in pH. Um, so in those systems, I've seen them work um, flawlessly. I've also seen them not work at all. So I think that that just depends on your following directions. Uh, the one thing that um, I do think is very important if you're using liquid nutrients to make sure you actually read those directions. Um, sometimes, you know, they, they direct you maybe to use a little too much or a little too little. But in terms of the directions, I'm saying like if they're telling you to mix each one separately and to do it one after the other after the other, you need to listen to them and you need to follow those because they're not just saying that to say it. They're saying that because those were scientifically engineered to be put in one after another. Um, the only product I can think to give an example would be like Heavy 16. You know, they want you to mix those different additives separately. You know, they want to put it in the water, but one at a time and they want you to go in a certain order to then create that pH buffer and, you know, make sure everything mixes and comes into contact right. And I do know that if you're not doing it, you know, correctly or you're mixing stuff in a different order, it can really screw that system that they've developed up in their nutrients. Now, personally, I am not a fan of the pH buffered nutrients. No, oh, neither am I. Then we probably share some of the same sentiments. Like if your water or your nutrient mixture doesn't need to be pH adjusted afterwards, you know, like, uh, my grow up in Maine, we had amazingly like pH balanced water. Like it was six, one right out of the tap. Oh, nice. And yeah. And whatever I added to it, it always, you know, unless, you know, silica additives obviously drop it pretty drastically, but pretty much everything stays within that same, that right pH range. And, um, you know, using pH buffered nutrients, was just one more chemical inside of that nutrient mixture that was that I didn't need and was going to drive up PPMs um, before I needed to do it. You know, so that was a short-lived experiment with uh, with my grow that I never really wanted to continue with. So those are my personal thoughts. Yeah, no, I totally feel you. I mean, honestly, uh, to be real with you, I'm all organic all the way. I just um, really like, I mean, I'm one of those kind of people where if you're doing it away and you like the way you're doing it, I'm never going to tell you you're wrong, especially because I don't believe there is a wrong way to grow. Um, you know, it's we're all learning. So I feel, especially for, for those kind of people using the synthetics and whatnot, like I'll always, you know, give advice on how you can switch away from them. But I mean, if you're dedicated to them, I'm just, you know, just want to help kind of thing. I, I don't really have or want to steer anyone away from something that they're really successful with or really love. But uh, I totally feel you because I, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of them either, especially for my personal use. I would never use them. Not to say that they're bad products, but it's just goes into like kind of what you said. It's just one more additive. It's one more one more non-natural element that you're kind of adding that you then need to, you know, flush or hope to flush might not ever be able to flush. Right, and right. since the research just isn't, I guess, there yet, 
some of these properties and some of these nutrients, I do feel like we're going to find some very unfortunate, you know, there, there's going to be some very unfortunate findings come out about some of these chemicals and what they might be doing, you know, once decarboxylation happens with the can, you know, with your cannabis or, or lighting or whatever happens. Yeah, I just feel like there's going to be residuals left that we're going to find down the road are just really not good for us. Oh, no doubt, dude. I, I don't know if you've uh, ever heard of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Oh, I have not, but it sounds nasty. Oh, okay. <laughs> so cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is essentially like an overload of your CB1 and CB2 receptors. And the word hyperemesis is actually like, you know, super throwing up. Oh, damn. And I've had some recent bouts of this. I've actually just recently gone 73 days without any cannabinoid um, being introduced into my system because I went five days of throwing up pretty much nonstop. So, but I'm a, bur a firm believer that it's not just, or it's not cannabinoid overload, that it's more what we put on and put in our plants that people are reacting to. You know, there was a 2001 uh, Big Buds article that was entitled something like uh, radioactive buds or something like that. And they did tests on different product and, and different flush times and, and nutrient levels and the heavy metals that were left behind during different phases and lengths of, of flushing and, and using different nutrients was remarkable. And the long-term effect, I mean, we already know that the cannabis plant absorbs so much crap up from the soil. I mean, we use that to remediate soil on, on nuclear test grounds. So it totally makes sense that this plant's going to hold on to a lot more stuff than, than we anticipate or, you know, things that we might not even know that we're putting into the soil. So the testing, you know, greatly needs to improve, um, across the board on safety, you know, safely consuming the cannabis plant in all the facets. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, that that just kind of made me think like a, a quick side story. I mean, it's such a unique plant to where I've heard a rumor of a guy here that had a rat problem. He put out rat poison all over the side of his um, his houses because he had some rats, you know, chewing stems and, and all that nasty stuff. Anyways, put rat poison out. Some of the rats ate the rat poison started chewing on the stems some of those plants actually failed because of the rats being poisoned then you know chewing on putting all their enzymes saliva and all that back into the plant uh. um, so i mean it's crazy what they can pick up and you know what can become systemic inside of a plant just from you know piercing it gross um so yeah i mean i don't think there's really i'm even at the point now where i i kind of think you know the the air too that they're in the environments that they're in depending on i guess where you're living and kind of how you're growing that's a big factor as well if you know you're using maybe um tarp like plastic tarps that are have residuals on i mean anyways won't go into it just there's just no telling what this plant can yeah really uphold and, and keep in its system once you know it's introduced right so aj moving on to another you know grower tip question here What's the single highest leverage move a grower can do in order to increase the yield off of a single plant? You know, because we're focused on the home grower here and every home grower is limited to different numbers of arbitrary plant count limits. Yep. Um, so, you know, what can they do to increase the yield off of a single plant? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things is definitely going to be um, how much you're watering really trying to hit that balance, um, really, really making sure that those plants are, you know, drying out, obviously not wilting. You never want to wilt and you never want to overwater, but I think overwatering is just as almost just as bad as wilting. I wouldn't say it's quite as bad, but I mean, to really hit that nice medium, um, to where you kind of get, I guess, in a zone with your plant or your plants, depending on how many you have, but, I always personally do a pickup test. Um, some people really don't like it. I do know some home growers. I mean, I've grown with some home growers that are handicapped in different various ways uh, to where it might be difficult to pick up your pot. But I always believe it's very important to kind of get that nice um, feeling of kind of where your plant is at um, in terms of water. I truly believe that if you are able to pick up your plant, 
you should do it every day uh, just to figure out, you know, the perfect amount of water that it needs. Um, I mean, a lot of people, you know, you get lazy when you're at home. Sometimes you don't want to do whatever because you want to get to relaxing. And so you just want to water quickly. I always think that that's fine, too. But I would always go on the lighter side and maybe do more light waterings. Um Obviously, like we talked about, you don't want to let anything wilt. But I do believe that the where plants explode is, you know, when they're hungry and when they're ready to eat, just because they're using and they're forcing all of that energy, all of the energy to get used as opposed to, you know, they're reserving some nutrients and keeping, you know, just, I guess, coasting along as opposed to really thriving and really trying to express themselves in their full potential of using what you've given them. Great. Those are some great points. Um I've heard a little bit of research about uh, what can be done when, you know, underwatering, letting that plant wilt a little bit and, and the stress that can be induced from that. So, but I've never heard any research to the stresses of overwatering. It's basically just you're, you're killing off the root zone and, and not letting it breathe, which is important to the overall plant health and a healthy root zone too. So for sure. Yeah. With, with, I mean, in my personal experience, I've always noticed, you know, you correct it pretty quickly with the overall watering. I've just kind of noticed it stunts them. I've, yeah. Like what you said, it just doesn't allow them to reach their full potential just because they're kind of sitting and they're not able to, you know, I guess, uh, clear out all that water for themselves. So they kind of just have to sit there and, and uptake it as they will, but you know, they can't just chug like we can. Totally. Yeah. And we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors right here. We have Danny Danko, Harvest Mutual Seed Bank, and the amazing Dr. Zimes. First up is my friend Danny Danko and his book, Cannabis, A Beginner's Guide to Growing Marijuana. Danny has graciously supplied us a few books out of his personal stash to give away to each or uh, the top winner in each of our 5k quarterly giveaways and he's also willing to sign personally sign all of the blue members books that are purchased so if you're a blue member of mygrowpass.com you're able to purchase a book and danny will send it straight from the high times office with a personalized signature for you So he's an amazing guy and he wanted to give back to our community a little bit. So go check out growcastpodcast.com slash Denko to purchase your book or become a member and just email us directly and we'll help set up the payment and inscription notice. Next up, we have Harvest Mutual Seed Bank. Michael is a good friend of mine as well. And he gives free shipping to all of our listeners just by using the code GROWCAST at checkout. And members get 10% plus free shipping. So all you have to do is become a member and you can save 10% on all your seed orders from some amazing top quality breeders. Their goal is to provide a great customer experience and tremendous value through their online store. Their founders have over 30 years of combined experience in the industry in all facets of the game and are happy to help with any questions you have after purchase. Check out harvestmutualseedbank.com for more information. And the amazing Dr. Zymes, you've seen a lot about it on our Instagram lately and have recently heard a podcast episode with Mary Beth on Growcast. They talk all about IPM and how the amazing Dr. Zymes is the solution for that, that she crafted with the help of some other people. The amazing Dr. Zymes Eliminator is a revolutionary green solution that kills and eliminates soft bodied insects, molds, and mildews on your indoor or outdoor gardens. Eliminator is a proprietary formula handcrafted to ensure quality control. All you have to do is go to drzymes.com and use growcast10 for 10% off your entire order or members can save 25% after you become a member at mygrowpass.com. Thanks to all our wonderful sponsors and thanks to all our listeners out there for using our sponsors codes. They certainly appreciate it and we do too. So AJ, let's get back into things and let's talk about IPM in an indoor garden. You made a great point earlier that uh, you're only as good as your weakest plant, uh, which I really liked because that's so true. You're uh, 
your weak plant is going to be the first to get infected with something, and then that can quickly spread across your garden. Oh, yeah. So what are your protocols and or go-to items to keep your garden and your plants clean and healthy? Yeah. So, I mean, I would say that every single person on the planet, if you're growing cannabis, you need to have a loop or a scope or a something in order to to view your plants. Um, it doesn't need to be anything high tech. I personally use a 32, um, 32 times scope, just a handheld uh, that I carry around with me all the time. I do have a 20 um, as well. Anyways, it's just basically a little like jeweler's loop. You can buy them on Amazon. I think that those are really essential just because you need to know what you're dealing with. Um, pest identification, I'm no entomologist at all. Uh, pest identification, though, has come so far in terms of if you're able to find a leaf um, that you know has a problem, stick that in a Ziploc bag, grab your magnifying glass, you know, see what it is. If you don't know what it is, that's what Google is great for. There's tons of pest identification websites. And I mean, cannabis We've got your, I shouldn't say we, but you know, they, they've got most pests figured out in terms of if you're going to find it in your garden, someone else has probably already found it in their garden. So there is somewhere where you can try to identify the pest and then take care of it um, based off what you found, because each pest, depending on what it's doing, needs to be handled in a different way. The reason why I say it needs to be handled in a different way is because I'm all about biocontrol. I love bugs fighting bugs and doing it the cleanest, most natural way possible. There are plenty of sprays out there. Uh, we could talk for hours on the different sprays and products and all that that worked for the different bugs and what kills what. Because, I mean, I've heard plenty of people say, you know, this one spray works phenomenal against russets, but it doesn't do anything to broads or this spray just destroys thrips, but it, it won't kill aphids or all of that nonsense. So, Biocontrol to me is kind of the most successful you can be um, in hunting everything and making sure that you're killing what you need to kill just because you can find bugs that not only will kill the one problem you have, but then will eradicate others. Um, not only that, too, but, you know, the bugs, they'll eat eggs, they'll eat the adults, the larva, kind of whatever you need gone, the bugs will take care of it. If you buy the right ones and you can keep um, temperatures and humidity stable for their liking yeah, I mean, you can thrive, uh, never have a growing problem ever if you keep up with IPM or I should say biocontrol in a natural regimen. It is very hard. I do understand that for for most because they do not have a luxury of having a like a biocontrol supplier. You can order bugs and biocontrol online. Um, they can get to you, I think, in like two days or something like that. But um, I do have the luxury of having like an actual facility like 20 minutes down the road from me. So I kind of am spoiled in a sense where I can just literally go pick up bugs to go kill whatever problem I have in my garden. Can you give us a couple of your uh, your most favorite biocontrol insects? Oh, for sure. And that's what I, oh man, I'll geek out hard. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I really, uh, I enjoy phalasses. Um, they're very expensive, but phalasses will kind of eradicate most problems with broad mites, um, they, they'll go after spider mites too. Broads are always the ones I feel like that are very hard um, to kill if you do have them, just because they're, they're very hard to spot. They're microscopic. Even with like a full-on microscope, they're sometimes hard to spot. Their damage, though, is kind of obvious. Um, but when you have those, those are a real worry. Obviously, most people are most freaked out about the spider mite or the two-spot. Those I love using Persimilis. Um, I also like Californicus. Uh, Persimilis, though, if you if anyone out there wants to get Persimilis, they are big, mean, and will just destroy adult spider mites. Um, they do go after some eggs, but they love going after spider mites. You got to keep um, pretty high humidity, though. You're you're looking for at least about sixty percent humidity. You can maybe fall down to fifty five, but you got to keep it around sixty, which is sometimes really hard uh, depending on what stage you're in. But I mean, if you're catching spider mites kind of in an early stage, if you release some persimilis, they will be gone quick. Um, as long as you, you know, you keep up from time to time, the cheaper bugs that I recommend people get that aren't as expensive and you don't have to worry about as much, you can get sachets of them. Um, basically a little pack of bugs that you can hang on branches and those, uh, Cucamaris and, uh, Andersoni, I would recommend, and as well as Schwartzky to kind of keep a day-to-day -day cleanliness of your grow, no matter what size or style. If you get a couple of those packs of those different varieties, 
those can pretty much eradicate um, any of the problems that you're having, as long as you don't have a full on outbreak. If you just have, you know, very residual signs of things, um, I would say those three are really, really good at keeping things under wraps. And then for the soil, soil pests are a whole nother game. So if you're running into soil, I would always use nematodes if you can. They are a bit expensive, but I can't stress how um, good nematodes are for the soil. And you really can't use, you could never use enough. I mean, you could waste money by maybe using too many, but not just like, you know, if you use 5 million in a 10 gallon, it's not going to do anything other than just, you know, fill up a 10 gallon full of nematodes. It's not like you're going to poison it or or add too much of um, biocontrol. I guess that's where I'm getting at is you can never add too much biocontrol. As a as opposed to the nematodes, though, rove beetles, really good for thrips, aphids, that kind of stuff. That's a great rundown right there, AJ. Thanks so much. Absolutely. So what kind of character traits are the most important for a new grower to to kind of cultivate, if you will, in order for them to be successful? Uh, asking questions. Even if you know the answer to a question, um, ask questions uh, just because what my, so if you ask me, you know, about pH and water, and then I ask you about pH and water, we're probably going to give two different answers that are both going to be right. They're just going to be different. Um, so I always stress people to, even if you know the answer to something, if you still have questions about it, just ask. Um, Cause I mean, you're just getting more knowledge and, and more base to stand your ground on and, you know, to execute what you need to get done. Like I said, we're all just trying to learn. I really, really like adopting that um, principle of no matter what level of growing you are, you should always be asking questions. I do think too, going into the kind of, you know, asking questions, Go to, you know, grow stores. A lot of people view employees of grow stores in weird ways. And I don't know why, but those guys know for the most part what they're talking about and what they're doing. Um, so I always love to, you know, chat it up with the local guys at the grow shop just because they they get the most, you know, feedback of what's working, what's not working. Most of those guys do have grows. Most of them, you know, are in the industry in some kind of way. So I, I think that they're one of the greatest secrets of just finding out answers to just general questions or really, you know, just shooting the shit with people who like doing what you kind of do. You know, I, I feel like that's kind of a, a good way. Also, just, you know, listening, making sure that you are taking that time to listen to somebody, even if you feel like you might be a more superior grower uh, than them. I still always recommend listening, you know, very intently to kind of anyone when they're talking about growing, if it, it really is their passion, because they're going to have some gold somewhere in there. Yeah. One of the reasons we started this podcast was to kind of get to a, you know, standard operating procedure, like a, a best practices for home growers. You know, that's why we ask every guest the same set of questions um, which I think are, are, you know, some of the most important questions and impactful questions for the home grower. It's so that we can kind of, you know, get what the best growers around are, are doing. And, you know, if we can extract that and say that, you know, seven out of 10 or 15 out of 20 are basically telling you to, to be clean when you're going in your grow room, you know, that's the number one thing that you need to be able to do to, you know, have good IPM then maybe every grower listening is going to heed that advice and, and be clean and change their clothes and change their shoes and maybe even shower before heading into their grow space, not dragging in all that, uh, junk from the outdoors and their day at work or whatever. So, you know, it is, it is important to continue to listen and learn because everybody does it differently. But I, I think we're getting to a point where we're kind of distilling down to a, you know, a set of best practices, at least on a very general level. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, to get, I guess, more specific than on that terms. Yeah. I mean, the, the cleanliness is going to be a big thing. I would definitely say after every round, you know, to make sure to definitely do a deep clean, um, you're definitely going to want to use something in terms of bleach with no plants around or something just that's going to very deep, deep, deep clean everything in your grow environment. Obviously you're going to want to go back over it. So there's no residuals or anything like that could affect plants moving in. But I mean, that I would say then is one of the biggest steps for afterwards, um, making sure that ever in between each round, uh, you're really doing a deep clean of everything to make sure that you're not building any nests or anything like that in terms of, um, you know, problems that are just going to keep coming up if you're never doing a deep clean. 
and then I, w- I would say two dogs. Um, a lot of people love their dog. <laughs> I love my dog. Dogs can be really detrimental to grows. Um, they, anything can jump on them. Anything can jump off of them, depending on where, what you got going on. I would just say, kind of be wary of your dog, knowing that, uh, you have no idea what's on your dog and, um, it could be a potential really bad problem if something jumps off your dog, you know, and starts an infestation into your grow. That's a really great point on on both accounts, actually. The deep clean and, you know, any pet of any nature, dogs, cats, I guess any furry animal, yep. you know, really should be kept out of at least your indoor grow setting. I mean, outdoor, those pests are going to be around anyways, but right. uh, at least at least keep those those furry animals that we love so much out of your indoor gardens. Yeah, it's you just never know. It's one of those things. You just never know what could be on them. Right. Uh, so, AJ, to wrap things up here, and as we wrap things up, a reminder to our audience that if you'd like to hear a little bit more from AJ, uh, head on over to thehomegrownhelpers.com slash bonus, and you can gain access to the next five questions that we're going to ask AJ as we wrap things up here and all of the other interviewees that we've been doing over the last six months or so. Um, and all the future ones, um, once you're on the list, we'll send out emails reminding you that we launched the podcast today and give you a link directly to that bonus content. So AJ, any last bits of wisdom or advice that you'd like to impart on the audience? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the, I guess to go back a little bit with the, just be, uh, I guess for any, any grower out there. And I think I think this kind of, I can speak for all of us when I say just persistence and the patient and open-mindedness, like one of the questions that it says, if you have persistence, um, you don't let, you know, one problem, even if it does hypothetically take out some plants or maybe take out a round, you got to keep going because we're all learning. We've all had, you know, shit happen. Um, Patience and just the terms of, unless you're growing, you know, hydroponic or aeroponic, you're probably not going to see the results uh, very quickly if you did have a problem and you're trying to eradicate it or fix it. Um, So just staying patient, staying positive. And then the open-mindedness, really just going back to ask questions. Um, No one knows everything. So we're all trying to learn. We're all trying to get better. And um, the more questions you ask, you know, the more knowledge you can gain. So that's, that's kind of it. Awesome. Thank you. Now, AJ, um, how can our audience find and connect with you if they'd so like to? Uh, well, I'm on Instagram, just under my name is AJ Ortonstone. It's A-J-O-R-T-E-N-S-T-O-N-E. Um, that's really what we're using for social media right now. My farm is Truly Organic, uh, T-R-U-L-Y-O-R-E-G-A-N-I-C. And those are the two outlets you can find us on right now. And we're going to be getting, yeah, that consulting um up soon and when we do we'll be sure to you know kind of try to get it to you guys or some somehow i want to give a name but i that's kind of where we're stuck right now is what to name it so i I wish i had something for you but i don't i don't i don't want to be super lame and just say something generic right now (laughs) no worries no worries um so if you'd like to enlist the services of aj uh you can reach out to us here at the show it's rob at thehomegrownhelpers.com and we'll help make an introduction to either AJ or any one of our fine cannabis consultants that we've had on the show either in the past or in the future. Also, if you can take the time and drop us a five-star review, we'd really appreciate that. That goes a long way with helping us reach more growers and have more of an impact with our mission here at The Homegrown Helpers. So AJ, thanks so much for your time today. We really appreciate it, but we're going to keep you around for those five more questions. So audience, make sure to head on over to thehomegrownhelpers.com slash bonus and download those today. Until next time, happy growing and get on out there and keep your plants healthy and happy.